uh, maybe during the lab. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, that's it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. So, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. I guess we can get started. Folks will join slowly. Yeah, so th this will be uh, the first advanced topic uh, that, that you will be attending as part of this winter school. Uh, so just a disclaimer that whatever we discussed in the morning about CAS and CAS hierarchy, and uh, I, I kind of emphasize that they are useful. So in this session, we will kind of uh, find out that uh, all the things that we have discussed so far, uh, they, they are kind of points of concern uh, when we talk about security. Uh, so we'll follow the same protocol. Uh, it will be good if you can uh, post your questions on, on the chat box, but uh, we will take it, uh, you know, during our break points, once in 15, 20 minutes. Okay. This is mostly because of online setup and then internet uh, bandwidth issues, right? And then yeah, but but feel free to ask uh, questions. The uh, uh, more the better. Okay, so uh, th this is a summary of what uh, this winter school has provided you so far. So now you are uh, aware of uh, out of order processors, branch predictor, CASs, TLBs, prefetchers, right? And then a bit of interconnect if not in detail. And so if you look at uh, for, from the computer architecture point of view, these are uh, actually termed as micro architecture. Why? Because they are not directly exposed to the programmer, but uh, they are there inside our chips to uh, make sure that our programs run faster, right? So all the lectures that uh, you have so far, they only talk about you know improving latency, uh, mitigating latency from the processor side, pipeline, CAS, TLV, page table worker, whatever, right? So now we will see why. Uh, all these micro architectures that, that or the uh, micro architectural techniques that have been proposed from last uh, three, four decades, well, why they are uh, creating a new headache uh, for the security uh, community. Okay. So before we jump into uh, the security aspects of micro architecture, this is uh, a one on one definition of what exactly it means when someone says it's secure, right? Uh, so there's a standard uh, definition which is called the CIA definition, which which stands for confidentiality, integrity, and reliability. So confidentiality, uh, you can actually correlate with your processor or process or an application. And the way it is defined is, uh, as, as a process or as an application, uh, you don't see what you are not supposed to see. Right? You can actually correlate with your virtual address. You can uh, uh, correlate with your virtual memory, all of the concepts, right? So if, if you are not allowed to see something or if you're not supposed to see something, so you should not be seeing it. OK, so that that's the confidentiality aspect of it. The next level, which is a bit more tricky, which is integrity. And here, uh, you know, one process or one application can actually go one step ahead and then start changing the content or, or maybe writing, overwriting. Uh, but remember, even if the process is not, not supposed to see or read. OK, and the final uh, property is kind of pretty uh, intuitive. It's uh, availability where, where uh, there is a malicious application which is just trying to play a game by, uh, you know, uh, some kind of denial of service uh, uh, attack scenario. Uh, you, you can easily correlate with a last level cache where let's say one core is just thrashing by writing a big uh, by, by by accessing a big array using a loop, then all other cores will be uh, getting misses in their private uh, in their last level cases. So this is uh, one form of uh, availability uh, uh, aspect of security. So in this uh, session, I will be mostly covering the confidentiality part. Uh, that's the key, 
and then uh, maybe uh, later uh, integrity if, if time permits, right? But but confidentiality will be the highlight of this session. Okay, so you must have seen uh, uh, commercials uh, uh, from from Intel, uh, saying Intel inside, right? Uh, but from last few years, uh, there are various kinds of uh, interesting memes that have come up, which which actually put various attacks inside. So so uh, these are some of the famous attacks that appeared in last four five years. Uh, they are kind of specter meltdown and all. Uh, that that's not the whole point here. Uh, the, the key message that I want to send here is uh, performance was the actually key aspect when we talk about microarchitecture, but but now security is also another aspect that uh, microarchitects have to uh, look into. Uh, tons of media articles you will find uh, through various blogs, various uh, technical uh, uh, news articles, right? And then the uh, it won't be uh, surprising to say that uh, every now and then there is a new attack or, or there is a new way of uh, leaking information through microarchitecture. It's happening almost every month, if not weeks. So with that, let, let's understand how uh, information can be leaked. Then we'll try to connect uh, information leakage with uh, one of the simple microarchitecture cache. And then we will see what are the possible ways to attack a CAS and leak information. OK, so uh, this is uh, a code snippet or a pseudo code um, uh, of a famous uh, uh, crypto uh, algorithm. Uh, the crypto part is not important. Uh, we are actually discussing the architectural aspects here. So the uh, key here is uh, the uh, variable E, which is also known as the exponent. And whoever the attacker is, it may be a process, it may be uh, anything running in your uh, system, it's trying to uh, retrieve the value of E. So for the sake of simplicity, let's assume E is an actually array, and uh, the length of the array may be of 64 bit, 128 bit, or whatever, right? And uh, one of the victim application is actually uh, using this particular crypto uh, uh, code and if you can uh, look at this code carefully, there is a for loop that is iterating uh, based on the size of the exponent E. And there are a few operations that are happening based on the content of each index inside E. Okay, so if a particular index has value one, then there is a multiply operation and followed by reduce. So reduce is nothing but the modulo. But if a particular index is zero, then we are not performing this multiply and uh, reduce operation, right? So now uh, you can easily correlate with uh, the control flow uh, dependency and control flow things that, that Govind uh, must have talked about yesterday. And you can easily correlate that. So whenever I am accessing only the square and reduce, that means that particular exponent bit is zero. If I am doing both uh, square reduce and multiply reduce, then uh, that bit is one. Remember, these are addresses which will be mapped to memory. They will be there in the cache, right? So, so it will be uh, easy to find it out whether uh, they are actually on cache or not. Uh, we'll discuss that in a few slides, okay? So with, with that uh, background, uh, let's see how we can uh, extract or how we can correlate uh, this with uh, exact key through uh, CAS, okay? So uh, if you remember the morning uh, session, uh, I started with the notion of uh, memory wall and latency as the bottleneck, and that's why uh, CAS is coming to picture. But now this slide will tell you that uh, that is the main uh, or the primary culprit for, for uh, all this uh, security issues, okay? So this plot is showing uh, Access time, uh, remember the average memory access time, uh, access time for a particular load or a particular memory access. And uh, you can easily see there is a uh, two, it's a bimodal distribution, right? So there are some latency numbers which are let's say less than 110 or so. And there are many latency numbers which are more than 250 or so, right? So easily you can deduce that the accesses which are taking less than 100 cycles, maybe they are coming from the cache. 
and which are taking more than 250 cycles, they are certainly coming from off-chip uh, DRAM, right? So this, this is pretty easy to uh, uh, deduce, right? Once you have done that, then you need a mechanism to correlate uh, the, this kind of access patterns that you are observing with the exact code that we have discussed here, right? The square reduce or square reduce followed by multiply reduce. So if, if you just look at the latency numbers and any latency numbers which are below 100, so you can, you can uh, say that, okay, th these are the information which are there in the cache. I will see what are they. So usually you can correlate, okay, this is a zero, this is a zero, and this is a SR followed by MR, so it's actually one, right? So based on that, you'll be able to retrieve the key, okay? But, but we haven't discussed how, uh, like what exactly the attacker should do, so we are just going one step at a time. Okay? So what attacker can do, uh, this is a pretty toy attacker, uh, textbook kind of attacker, where we are assuming the attacker and victim they are actually sharing a particular library. Let's say the crypto library is shared by both attacker and victim. And uh, the code snippet that I showed, that can be easily converted into something like this. If uh, there is a secret bit uh, one, then the victim accesses some address, otherwise it doesn't, right? So what the attacker will do, the attacker will use an instruction called uh, CL flush. And the meaning of CL flush is you flush the content of uh, a cache line from the entire cache hierarchy, okay? So the attacker has flushed the address. Once it has flushed, it starts a timer. You can just uh, use uh, functions like get time of the day and accesses that address again. Remember, attacker has flushed it. That means the address is not there in the processor or its cache hierarchy, right? After uh, accessing it, if it finds that uh, the response time or the average memory access time is fast, which means victim has accessed it, right? So th this is a pretty simple way to uh, correlate that I'll be able to know whether victim has accessed address A or not. With, with the assumption that address A is shared by both uh, attacker and victim, uh, it, it is pretty common to share uh, some of the libraries uh, which are mapped to uh, the address space of both the processes, okay? So with that background, uh, I will try to characterize uh, the timing channels that we have seen, which actually exploits the timing difference between CAS and uh, DRAM into uh, two broad categories of attacks, which are called the side channel and covert channel attack. So in the side channel attack, uh, in the previous slide that I have shown, so there is a victim which is running, let's say, a pretty security critical application, and the spy is not supposed to see, even the OS is not allowing it to see, and then and, and as per the address space protection and everything is intact. But because they are sharing the cache, the spy is able to infer what exactly the victim is accessing based on the timing difference, okay? That's why it's called side channel. It's actually not a legitimate channel through which uh, the spy and victim should communicate. But because of our micro architecture, it's providing a you know, bypass route to get the data or to observe the data. The other extreme is uh, called the covert channel attack where there are no attacker and victim, but, but uh, there are multiple attackers who are trying to play a game in the system. You can simply, uh, correlate this with let's say two uh, spy or trojans which are uh, running uh, in your system and even if they are not supposed to communicate so let's say as per the os abstraction that they are running different processes they are not saving anything but through cas they can actually communicate okay based on latency difference so this guy can say that whenever uh, uh, you get a latency uh, which is uh, fast that means i want to communicate one and whenever you get a latency which is slow, that means I want to communicate zero. So based on that, you can actually communicate information. Okay, this is uh, uh, at a high level abstract view. So uh, we'll start jumping into the details slowly one step at a time, and we'll mostly focus on the last level CAS attack because that is shared by multiple cores in a multi-core system. And as I have already mentioned, the key here is there is a latency difference that is easily distinguishable when the data is coming from the last level cache or it's coming from the DRAM. So there are two categories of attacks. We already talked about uh, this flush bit attack at a high level. 
there are also eviction based attack so if you remember uh, my morning lecture on cash replacement policy for a given set whenever we get a miss we start replacing or evicting that block right so eviction based attacks are more practical it doesn't demand any notion of sharing between attacker and victim uh, sharing meaning sharing of voice pages and what the attacker can simply do is it can start accessing large arrays which can kick out the blocks of victim we will see how so the keyword is eviction here uh, and then in the previous case the keyword was flush okay uh the threat model uh, for this session we'll try to make it pretty simple we'll say that the attacker is successful if the attacker comes to know that a particular cache set has been accessed by a victim okay forget about a exact address uh, as long as we we uh, can say that okay set number 100 was accessed by victim we will define that as a successful attack at least for this session okay any question so far before we jump into more details so i'm, I'm looking at uh, the chat box if there anything you can type or you can unmute okay so i'm assuming all good Okay, so then uh, let's move on. So uh, now let's look into uh, all these attacks in in a more detailed way. So the first attack that I was talking about, or uh, first of its kind, is the flush reload attack, where the attacker uses a specialized instruction called CL flush, right? And the assumption is both attacker and victim are actually using a shared library or any uh, shared memory. and that's why both of them can actually access a particular address right and uh, but remember the goal is to find out whether the victim has accessed or not okay so this is the process the spy actually uh, uh, it, it maps the uh, shared library uh, so that means it will be mapped into its own address space and so obviously it will be there in the cache then the spy flushes uh, the victim reloads uh, whenever it needs it right so the re reload meaning uh, loading it from the dram and finally if uh, the spy reloads or tries to access the same address again if it gets a hit it is certainly uh, the case that victim has access that block right because the spy has already flushed it out right so th this is the simple uh, uh, attack that that uh, you can uh, mount it on your uh, Uh, laptops or desktop okay uh, there is a variation of this flush based attack which is called flush and flush where everything remains the same uh, you know first the attacker flushes and the victim reloads but finally uh, the spy flushes again okay instead of uh, trying to access the address again it it flushes that address again that means it uses a cl flush in step 1 it also uses a cl flush in step 3 and observe the timing difference but in this case the subtle issue here is if you get a hit in the cache that means it will take more time which is kind of counterintuitive to what we have discussed so far okay so just pay attention here if you are getting a hit for a cl flush you have to do more operation because there is something valid present in the cache you have to flush it to the dram if the data is not present it will take less amount of time okay so uh, these are some of the latency numbers uh, from some of the intel machines if you look at uh, you, you can take any uh, let's say the first one uh, uh, ev bridge you can see that on a hit the latency is let's say somewhere around 105 or so but in case of miss it starts from 110 goes till 130 so the, the range is different for a hit the range is 100 to uh, 125 Uh, for miss the, it, it starts from 110 to 130 but the key is you have to look at the probability distribution right what what fraction of time uh, this things happen having said that uh, the, this attacks are extremely noisy because you can see the gap is just few cycles 5 or 10 cycles so in real system with multiple processes running uh, this attack is not that effective uh, and then you may not be able to deduce 
or differentiate whether the victim has accessed it. OK. So now we'll move on to uh, the attacks where th there is no assumption about uh, page sharing between attacker and victim. And can we still uh, get information about the victim? And uh, one of the popular attacks uh, or the popular eviction based attacks is actually known as the prime and probe. Where what attacker does is this is again at a uh, abstract view. The spy fills the entire cache. OK, so you can easily do it by writing uh, a for loop and trying to access an array which is larger than the size of the LLC. And then remember, uh, this is a fixed size resource and uh, when the victim comes to access its data, it will get missed because the spy has already uh, filled the LLC with its own data. Right? Now the spy probes again, meaning spy tries to access the same addresses again, and now the spy will get misses, meaning it will observe longer latency because victim has come in between and it has evicted few uh, blocks of uh, the attacker or the spy, right? So if the attacker gets longer latency during the probe, which means this is the set of interest, right? That means this set was actually accessed by victim. And then as per my threat model, I said that if I can say that, OK, th this is the set that that was accessed by the victim, then uh, I'm a successful attack. OK. Uh, there are various parameters uh, of interest while, while mounting an attack because we have no control about uh, victims execution. OK, so although we talked about the notion of priming it and then waiting for a few time and then probing it, but it may happen that during the entire process, victim never comes or victim never accesses their LLC. Ideally, you would like to have the victim accesses during the wait step of the attacker because the attacker has already thrust the cache. It is waiting for the victim to come and then finally it will observe or probe, right? But you can have various combinations. The attacker can come multiple, uh, sorry, the victim can access, uh, access multiple times, or uh, the victim may come during the, you know, uh, the interphase uh, uh, in interval during the wait and pro phase. So then, in all these cases, your observation will be noisy. Typically, for for the applications that have been attacked so far, a gap of 5,000 to 10,000 cycle is good enough to to uh, have a clear distinction between whether the victim has accessed or not. But it, it's not a you know rule uh, that that you have to follow. Depending on the application, this this number may vary. Okay. Uh, another thing that that I want to emphasize here is, is the notion of uh, different cache hierarchies that we discussed in the morning. One of them was the inclusive cache hierarchy, if you remember. So just a quick uh, recap. In the inclusive cache, we said that the last level cache is a superset of private caches. That means whatever data is there in the attacker's private cache, it's also there in LLC. Whatever data which is present in uh, the victim's private cache, it's also there in uh, LLC, right? Now, when the attacker does prime probe attack by thrashing the last level cache, because of uh, you know fixed capacity or because it's mapped to the same set, uh, the block of victim will be evicted. And now once the block will be evicted because of a replacement policy, just to maintain the inclusivity property, now the cache controller at the last level cache will send a request to all the private caches saying, if you have this address, please invalidate yourself or, or please kick out itself, right? So this is actually helping the attacker. If you look at an in inclusive cache, the attacker can control the contents of a private cache of a victim by just thrusting the last level cache. But this is not possible in non-inclusive cache and exclusive cache. Although probabilistically it's possible, but, but it's not that simple. Okay, So you can easily correlate whatever ideas that we discussed in the morning, they are actually now becoming uh, points of concern. Right? The simple ideas which are helpful that they, they are uh, creating uh, more, more and more uh, security issues. Right, so I will pause again for any questions because this is an advanced topic. I don't want to just jump into many things without any understanding.
sir ha uh, hello yeah please go on yeah sir i have, uh, because this topic is new to me so i have a small doubt, small doubt uh, mm -hmm. so is hardware attack is related to only to data servers where the, there is memory or, or whatever you are talking about cases or it can happen in uh, personal computers no th these are not hardware attacks just to make it uh, precise these are micro architecture mm -hmm. attacks okay so ha hardware attacks are a bit different where you know the attacker has the access to let's say the internal dram it can touch the dram it can actually observe the power difference temperature difference or blah 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 right okay uh -huh. okay uh, but yeah so this micro architectural attacks can happen anywhere right so it can happen in a you know in your institute's lab right Mm -hmm. where you you are sharing your machine with some of your friends even though okay. they 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 have their own username and password but they can actually probe the cache cache is shared to both of them right uh, yeah, yeah. Friends, right uh. so so if, if your friend wants to know okay whether you are using an as library uh, then then the friend can mount a private probe attack uh, in your remote machine okay. right uh, yeah. okay okay so from the user perspective will the uh, will there be any change in kind of access time or something which can kind of indicate whether there is an attack which is actually actively going on yeah so this is a good question so what uh, you are suggesting is can we have a detector right which can or can we have some indication that the attack is actually happening yes, at the moment right so this is an open problem uh so the, although there are proposals in in the research community but but this is an open problem it's a difficult problem to detect because you know it is it's kind of a cat and mouse game every time you kind of detect that okay these are the best ways to detect an attacker the attacker may come up with a new fancy way of attack right so every, every time yes, you sir, have to chase to the attacker it. right so yes sir Okay, more questions. I think someone has asked one in the chat. Oh, is it? Oh, okay, yeah, Nikunj. Okay, since attacker uses last level cache to attack, does it mean that microarchitecture security can never be optimized by increasing the number of cache level or any other cache parameter that may provide optimum security? Wow, this is a heavily loaded question. Uh, see, the answer is yes and no. It it, it depends. what additional parameters you are bringing in to the table which is already not there right so even if you add another level it will have the similar parameters there will be uh, the sets there will be indexing there will be some comparison there will be latency difference there will be replacement policy right uh, so whatever you are asking these are all open problems so so if you are actually doing an ms or phd so these are the problems that you should look for that how exactly you should design your uh, cas so that all these attacks won't be possible what should you do to your replacement policy what should you do for your indexing we will discuss some of them uh, maybe in the last uh, part of the talk but but uh, these are all open problems okay D does that answer your question nikunj maybe just a thumbs up will do so you may be able to use like a, a separate uh, cryptographic hash for each of the process so that um, you can never know what is the actual kind of memory it is trying to access or what yeah, yeah 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 i will discuss that uh, in, the, in the last part of the talk we will discuss some of the things okay okay sir uh, okay there is a question from prithvi in the flush and flush attack how is the attacker benefited since no data manipulation or uses by the attacker yeah so let's look at the flush and flush okay see uh, here uh, the the goal of the attacker is to understand uh, let, let's say the example that i gave right to find out the value of e right and the attacker knows the address uh, to which that particular e is mapped right let, let's say that is part of the library that is the address space so the attacker knows uh, these are the addresses which are shared by me and victim now what attacker does instead of writing uh, a load instruction or you know just just accessing those libraries it uses the instruction cl flush so it's like within a for loop you cl flush address uh, wait for some time then again cl flush uh, cl flush wait cl flush continuously right and the comment that i made here is 
in the step 3 if the attacker is taking more time to flush it that means between step 1 and step 3 someone has actually brought the block into the cache right and uh, depending on the access pattern depending on uh, just a minute yeah depending on the latency difference and depending on what you want to extract you can easily get this kind of access pattern and do a post mortem analysis okay so is that clear prithvi okay so there is one more uh, pratyush or jack hammer and row hammer i don't know about jack hammer but i certainly know about row hammer whether row hammer attack considered in confidentiality domain no 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 so row hammer is an attack uh, which is violating the integrity so let me just spell it out what exactly row hammer attack is this is actually at the dram level uh, since we haven't talked about dram so far i didn't explain that so the idea of uh, row hammer is you kind of try to access one DRAM page or one DRAM row again and again, continuously within a loop, which is indirectly termed as hammering a particular row in DRAM. And uh, the side effect of that is the adjacent rows or the adjacent pages in DRAM, they get affected. So the simple example will be suddenly the ones will become zeros, right? So that means you are affecting the integrity something that you are not supposed to see you are overwriting it right it is uh, one step ahead of what we are discussing now is that clear pratyus okay okay then so let's move on uh, so the obvious question now comes is how how practical these attacks are so, uh, you know, are there uh, attacks that, that are done on a uh, real system in a real world where, where, you know, let's say bank transactions have been hacked into or something like that? Well, the answer is no. Uh, these, these are still, uh, I would say, compared to the software attacks or the other systems attacks that uh, you may be aware of, they are kind of in the infant stage. The, it may happen that in future we may get more and more, uh, you know, uh, vulnerability and uh, more, more uh, uh, you know, uh, attack, uh, more attacks which are which are, which are kind of practical. But uh, I will actually answer this question uh, after a few slides, and I will stress that even if they are not that practical at the moment, why we should be bothered about it and why we should try to fix it. Okay. So uh, to answer that question, I will actually jump into two attacks called Spectre and Meltdown. So these two attacks, they use CAS as a timing panel to uh, extract information. Uh, although they use CAS as a, a timing channel or a side channel, the key uh, idea of these attacks is they exploit the aggressive processor design in the form of you know, speculative execution and out of order processor. So uh, I'm pretty sure Govind and Arka would have talked about out of order processor and speculative execution in yesterday's lecture. So let, let, let's see this uh, particular attack, what exactly it is. Okay, it's a bit subtle. If you don't get it, uh, pause me just after the Spectre attack, we can revisit. Just a four line code. And this code is actually part of, uh, uh, you know, it, it can be part of any library, it can be part of any process, anything. Okay, Let, let's not uh, get into the technicalities or, or let's not bring complexity here. The key here is uh, the attacker is trying to access an array, which is uh, the, the, the cost array, and that is not mapped to attacker's address space. Okay, that means from the OS perspective, uh, attacker is not allowed to access this particular array. The attacker is not supposed to see what is there inside this array, right? However, uh, for some functionality, the attacker is providing a parameter uh, for victim to execute some of its function, okay? And in this case, the parameter is the variable attacker, okay? And it is initialized to four uh, pretty intelligently. We'll see why it's an intelligent move. And then, uh, this is the million dollar uh, effect, okay? 
So this if condition checks whether the value of attacker, which is four, is less than the size of this cos array, right? And uh, the size of the array is actually three. That means this particular statement is actually false. So the program should not access uh, the, the, all these uh, arrays or any statement after the if statement, right? How? Uh, and then there are other assumptions that the attacker has already flushed out, uh, you know, uh, the caches or thrust out the caches. That's why this particular array, which is actually accessed by the victim, is not there in the cache. So, for anything that is uh, uh, that that is coming from this particular array, it has to go to DRAM because the attacker has already thrust it. Okay. Now uh, let's see uh, why branch predictor and speculative execution are kind of helping the attacker. So we are actually stuck with this particular if statement. And we say that the statement should be false, but to our surprise, the branch predictor actually returned true. Now the question is why? It, it's, it's pretty uh, obvious and intuitive. The branch predictor should have said, no, 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 uh, th this condition is false, right? The branch predictor says uh, true because the attacker has actually mistrained the branch predictor. How? By by you know sending request or by already uh, using code where the value of attacker is always uh, less than three, right? So because of that, the branch predictor has trained itself uh, in the form of you know true 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 all the time. Uh, so so you can simply correlate it with the two bit predictor if if Govind has talked about it, right? And now the attacker has actually mistrained or fooled the branch predictor, and the processor has actually started executing this part of the program. Okay, even though it's not supposed to. And now what will happen? The processor is in the wrong path, which is also known as the speculative path or the transient path. Okay, the processor is assuming that the branch predictor is right. But but uh, eventually uh, the processor will realize that it's actually not. But as I have mentioned, this particular array is actually not there in the cache. So accessing anything related to this array will actually go to DRAM. That will be around say, 100 to 200 cycles. And in the meantime, the processor has already retrieved the corresponding data, right? So the, 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 there is some index here, cos array index four, right? And it has brought it into the caches. So now the situation is the data is actually present in the private caches or even the last level cache. So now what you should do, you guessed it right. You can just uh, run a flush reload or prime or probe cache attacks to get the exact value. So th this was actually the secret. Okay, we are we are not supposed to touch it, but you will be able to get the exact value. Let, let's see how. So uh, e eventually the processor will realize that it's a mistake. So it, it has to you know undo uh, or flush out all the wrong path instruction. But remember the cache has the data because the processor has moved ahead and it has brought the data. Now what uh, the attacker will do, attacker will try to access its own array, okay, which is my array. The, that attacker is uh, able to access because that is mapped to its own address space. And it will just run a loop. Like my array zero, my array five one two, my array one zero two four, and observe the access time. Suddenly, for one zero two four, it's uh, seeing that it is able to access the data pretty fast, with just five nanoseconds. That means the data is actually coming from the cache, which means the value of this particular index was actually two. That's why when attacker tries to access two into five one two one zero two four. It got the data in just five nanoseconds instead of 60 nanoseconds, right? So now you can see that uh, you are able to get the data. Not only observe what what was the access pattern, you now you are able to get the data that was not mapped to your address space. So just one slide before we we may pause. The other other attack is meltdown attack, which which is pretty intuitive uh, and it has nothing to do with the speculative execution, but it is actually a curse from the out of order execution. So let's look at this three line code with one comment. The first line is an exception. Okay, that means you will actually call an exception handler, right? And you should not 
start executing anything after step one. But if you look at statement one and three, they are independent. So our modern processor, what it will think is it's better to reorder them just to improve instruction level parallelism and to improve IPC, right? But this is actually a kernel array. From user level, you are not supposed to access it. And then uh, definitely it should uh, raise a page fault or a protection fault, right? But as I have said, we don't handle or the processor doesn't handle the page fault or any, any wrong uh, prediction immediately. It does it when it reaches the head of the ROB, when, when it actually tries to commit the instruction in order, right? And that gives sufficient time for the attacker to load the entire array into cache. And then you can do whatever we discussed in the previous thing, right? The attacker can just uh, write a for loop and try to access all this thing. So you know, in reality, you can actually dump the entire OS image into your cache and uh, access it from user space, right? So th this is, uh, you know, if you just think about it, it th this is really scary. I will pause here and take questions before we move on. Is Spectre Meltdown clear? Yes, sir. Yeah, feel free to uh, let me know if you have anything that is not clear because it, it's a bit subtle. It's not that straightforward. If not, then it's good. Uh, so that, that means you, you have the basics of uh, computer architecture, so you are able to connect all the dots now. So is there a reason why we are using some large numbers like 5, 12, 4096? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are various regions. So that they are actually, uh, you know, they are used uh, with the notion that they actually go to a different page. They are not part of the same OS page. So if you look at, uh, you know, the page size is 4 KB typically, right? Unless you go for a, you know, huge page of MBs and GBs, right? Yes, sir. And then, and, uh, and you, you can also uh, put a different number based on the cache size or associativity, right? So uh, this is just a number based on uh, the, the attacker's code or the, the authors who proposed it on their machine, right? But you can also come up with uh, different values here depending on page size, cache size, and other parameters. Okay, sir. And this will be OS agnostic, like it doesn't depend on the. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's OS agnostic. It it, it was successfully mounted on Mac, uh, Windows, Linux. Yes, all the OS. Okay, sir. Okay. If uh, there are no more questions, so then we can move on. So uh, now that we have talked about the the offensive side, which, which is the uh, attacks, it's also important to discuss uh, what are the possible uh, mitigation techniques that we can propose to mitigate all these attacks. Okay, So these are the slides that I uh, brought it from uh, my PhD student, Yasika, who is the TA for today's afternoon lab. So uh, broadly, uh, the mitigations are actually uh, can, can be categorized into uh, two techniques called cast randomization and cast partitioning. So we will go through them one by one. So before jumping into mitigation, let's look at what all we have so far. So if you correlate with the morning lecture on caches, you will find that there is a one-on-one -on -one mapping between uh, address and index bit, right? And then we said LLC is shared among multiple cores in a multi-core system. And third is there is a latency difference uh, that can be easily distinguishable whether you are getting the data from LLC or from DRAM. Now, if you have to provide uh, security, then you have to break all this basic definition that we have discussed in the morning, right? Let's start with the first one, which is the mapping itself. Can we come up with a non-deterministic mapping? So when we when, when we start with the notion of non-determinism, then the first thing that comes to our mind is can we kind of randomize these index bits? Can we come up with you know new hash functions which, which can always try to change it, uh, change the index bits automatically, and then because of which the attacker won't be able to know whether okay this particular address is mapped to this set or that set, and it won't be able to mount an eviction-based attack, right? 
So just to uh, illustrate, so for example, uh, now address A0 and A1 are mapped to set 2, but uh, through uh, randomization, they can actually map to any set, right? But the key here is you, you should uh, actually use an uh, encryption engine and that can uh, provide you a key so that you can randomize and re-randomize regularly. If you just randomize once, then again it becomes deterministic, right? So the idea should be put an encryption engine beside your last label cache, uh, generate a key, use that key to generate the index or the set number. Once you have done that, maybe depending on how agile your attacker is, you kind of remap or rekey uh, the same index bits again and again in a regular interval. Okay, so so that's the idea. Uh, you have to uh, periodically change the key or periodically change the indexing so that uh, attacker won't be able to guess what exactly is happening. Okay. I won't uh, get into the details because these are advanced topics, but but a high level idea is have an encryption engine that can provide you a key. Use that key to get a set number and uh, don't forget to remap it. OK. So one of the limitations of uh, th this kind of uh, mitigation technique is. See, we are just breaking the determinism between the address and indexing. Right, but but the cache is still shared among multiple applications or attacker and victim. So yeah, it, it may be the case that with randomized caches, the life of the attacker is becoming difficult, but certainly there is a non-zero probability that the attacker can still mount attack. Okay, maybe, maybe it will be highly probabilistic. So it all depends on how fast your attacker is, how, how quickly it can attack and other things. Because based on that, you have to remap or rekey your blocks frequently. Right? Another uh, possible mitigation technique is called cache partitioning. Pretty intuitive. Uh, if you remember, we said that LLC is shared among multiple applications. So what if we break that statement? We say no, it's 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 no longer shared, uh, and then it's not private. Although, okay, so don't get confused. It is actually the last level cache which is shared by multiple cores, but dynamically we can create isolated regions. Let's say for each process, I will provide few uh, KBs or few MBs that, that that particular process will be able to access, not all, right? So there are various ways to uh, uh, implement or, or uh, come up with uh, this functionality of cache partitioning. The first one is page coloring. Uh, a pretty neat idea. Uh, let's look at how it can be done. So the page coloring uh, algorithm actually uh, tries to change the indexing function, and based on that, it will make sure that each core has its own uh, set of uh, addresses or own set of blocks, which are completely uh, isolated. Okay, let's see how it can be done. So uh, th these are the typical. Uh, address mapping techniques that we have uh, talked in the morning. You have tag bits, you have index bits. So in this case, we are talking about a cache with uh, 2048 sets and a block size of 64 bytes. Now, if your page size is 4 KB, the OS page size is 4 KB, then that means the lower LSB 12 bits are kind of gone for block offset and part of LLC index. But you still have uh, five bits left, which are contributing to the index. Right now, what you can do is you can use this five bits to make sure that all your indexing are actually mapped to two to the power five different regions. Okay, that's why they are called uh, coloring because it creates 32 different colors. And then uh, in this case, each region is of size of 64 KB, depending on the uh, numbers that we have discussed so far. Okay. So this is how it will look like, right? You have your uh, physical memory, and now you have different regions at the last level cache also. And remember, each color corresponds to each process, right? So that means no two processes can access the same set. They are isolated at the indexing level, okay? Uh, you can go through uh, the, this particular slide maybe in a more detail to understand uh, other subtleties, but but uh, in the interest of time, I'll just jump into uh, the limitation part of uh, page coloring. So one of the primary limitation of this technique is this is based on the OS approach. Right? So the OS allocates memory based on that allocation. You are allocating LLC. 
this is good as long as your memory requirement and cache requirements are kind of similar. That means if your DRAM requirement is high and cache requirement is high and there is a direct correlation between them, then this is a good technique. If it is not, then it may happen that you need small amount of LLC, but more memory or more amount of LLC or small memory, then you will be eventually uh, wasting your memory space or cache space, which can lead to performance degradation. The other approach to uh, implement cache partitioning is way partitioning. I remember we talked about two way, four way associative cache. What if we kind of divide our ways to multiple applications, right? So now the spy, if we are dealing with a four way associative cache, the spy will have, let's say, two ways. The victim will have two ways. And remember, even the cache replacement policy will be limited to their own ways. Okay, so the spy can't replace or evict something from the victim's uh, ways. Okay, so uh, th this kind of things are already implemented uh, in in commercial machine. For example, Intel CAT is one of the ideas that you can go and refer and see that this kind of partitioning is already there, right? Again, uh, I won't go into you know much more details about these topics, but. One of the limitation of this particular partitioning is the number of isolation boundaries that you can create is limited by the number of ways. If you have a 16 way associative cache, that means at max you can create 16 isolated regions, right? And not more than that. But what if your system is running 32 processes, right? Then, then there is no clear answer how to enter it. Finally, it's a set partitioning similar to page coloring, but instead of using page coloring, use another mapping function which can uh, decide on the fly what is the requirement of an application, how much memory it wants, and then you can actually create uh, you know, a notion of clusters. Remember, we started with the notion of byte, then line, then set. Now I'm bringing another term called cluster where each cluster is collection of sets. Right? And they are completely mutually exclusive. So one application won't be able to see or access uh, the cluster that is not mapped to uh, it, its own address space. Right? And that can be done through uh, various ways. One of the ways is actually you can have a mapping function which makes sure that you know these are the sets that are mapped to application one, these are the sets which are mapped to application two. Okay. It can be non-contiguous, it can be, you know, uh, it it, it it may not be power of two. You can you can try whatever you want. The only downside of this is who will decide how many clusters you want? Who will decide what is the requirement, right? So basically you need some information or some support from, from the top of the system stack, either OS or maybe programmer or runtime, right? So uh, th these are the issues with uh, this approach. Uh, we, we also talked about the spectra and meltdown attack, which has uh, a different uh, way, way of uh, attacking the same cache and just isolating may not help. So for that, what you need to do is uh, you can actually come up with a better cache hierarchy where you will say that, okay, whenever my processor is actually operating in a speculative mode, right, in the wrong path, that time I will actually put my data in a specialized cache called let's say L0 cache. These are tiny caches which are used only for storing data when the processor is executing in the speculative mode. Okay, And uh, what you can then do is for once the instructions are committed, that means they are no longer in the wrong path, then you can put them back into the rest of the hierarchy, L1, L2, L3 and blah, blah, blah. In this way, uh, the specter attacker won't be able to use cache hierarchy as a side channel to mount specter attack, right? So the basic idea is you bypass the DRAM response during the speculative part, put it in a speculative cache. Once it is committed, once you know that the instructions are no longer speculative, they are actually on the right path, you put it uh, back into your actual caches, okay? So uh, obviously there are other uh, subtleties that, that I'm not going through it. Uh, I'm just giving you a high level overview. Another important aspect of all these ideas is on a context switch, you have to make sure that you kind of invalidate all the entries in the cache. Otherwise, a new process may come and start uh, accessing this uh, data through uh, different flush reload or prime and prime attack, right? I'll pause here. We, we are kind of entering into the last part of uh, the talk.
Any questions on the mitigations? Uh, the specter attack. Uh, mm -hmm. If the compiler itself knows that uh, at compile time that uh, the slope is false, it can remove it, right? Uh, compiler can do many things, but not everything, right? Because you know, compiler has no idea about the dynamics of out of order processor. Like how many entries are there in the ROB? How many stages of pipeline the processor is using, right? And uh, at the runtime, uh, you know, you may have a completely different picture altogether. Having said that, there are proposals from the compiler field where, you know, when you generate the code, you make sure that uh, this kind of uh, gadgets or code gadgets are not generated by the compiler. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, sir. but uh, as such, compiler does optimization, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. That's what I'm saying. Com compiler can do, compiler can do, but how effective it will be in all the cases that that is a bit debatable. Okay. okay. Yeah. Compiler can certainly help. Sir, uh, what does it mean if uh, processor is in uh, working in speculative mode? So, what does it mean? Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure whether you have attended Govind's lecture yesterday. So speculative mode meaning, uh, let's say there is a heap condition and then the branch predictor is actually, uh, it, it's it's not that highly accurate, but but uh, it actually say that, okay, that particular heap condition will be taken, so the processor should move on, right? So the processor actually moved on and started executing all the instructions that are inside the heap condition, okay? Assuming it will be true. Right. Eventually, when when the instruction enters the final stage of the pipeline, when uh, all the checkings happen, that whether the instruction is actually correct instruction that the processor should have executed, then okay. the processor realized, no, 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 the branch predictor made a mistake and I should not have executed it. So this is the speculative path. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah. Understood. Okay. okay thanks. Okay, Nikunj has a question. Can the OS image replicated by attacker for say any N processor be used to initiate attack on N plus two, N plus four, or further different processor which might have enough security? If yes, will that image can be further used to leverage all kinds of? Okay, I'm kind of confused because it's again a bit uh, loaded. Are you saying uh, if the OS data structures are mapped to different processes uh, that's why it is uh, it is kind of easy to mount the attack uh, if yes then uh, yeah th that's kind of true so that was the basis for meltdown attack so one of the mitigation techniques that uh, folks from linux they came up with to mitigate uh, uh, meltdown is actually to stop this kind of uh, definition, right? So, so uh, the address space won't be shared among all the processes, right? So, so uh, the kernel will have its own page table, user will have its own page table, kind of, right? So, there is an isolation uh, from the OS point of view. Is that Nikunj, uh, what what you wanted to ask, and uh, is that the answer? Okay. Uh, sir, uh, the new AMD chips, they use a chiplet kind of design because of uh -huh. the cache hierarchy is uh, somewhat different and the mm -hmm. cache arrangement is somewhat different. Mm -hmm. So will this change the way these ca these attacks are implemented? Yeah, so, so I don't know whether others know about chiplet architecture. So let me just give a high level definition. So chiplet architecture is a new concept, if, if not completely new, but but relatively new where you know different uh, providers different vendors they design their own uh, uh, let's say micro architectural ideas or uh, you know uh, own memory and device and all and finally they are integrated uh, through a, a technology called 2.5d integration okay so uh, the question that uh, we got is uh, even in chiplet architecture can we mount uh, cas attack you can, but, but the semantics will be a bit different, okay? So you won't be surprised if you see uh, attacks on chiplet uh, architecture maybe in a year or two. There, there are already few attacks that are coming, okay? Uh, but but uh, certainly it's possible. 
but it's not that straightforward. You have you have to find out something else, right? Uh, on top of what we are discussing now. Okay, sir. More questions on mitigations? Okay, Nikunj again. Can the fabrication of the chips be actually useful in optimizing and avoiding this microarchitecture? Okay. So that's a different ball game altogether. Here we are talking about microarchitecture and the design of microarchitecture, right? What you are suggesting is some kind of root of trust. Well, when you uh, fabricate a chip, you you uh, kind of uh, you know provide a key or provide a signature, make sure that these attacks don't happen. That that's a bit costly and a bit difficult to achieve, you know, at, at least in the in the current world, right? Uh, people are trying it. It's not like that this idea doesn't make sense. It makes sense, but but there are many trade-offs that you have to look into. Okay. So I had one question regarding the um, at, at, at the mitigation technique where we were using a cryptographic key. Uh -huh. That doesn't it just change the attack surface. So once you predict how the keys key is being generated, you can essentially replicate it on say your device and find out wh what will be the next uh, arrangement of the cache or something. Yeah, yeah. So you, your statement is correct. Uh, assuming the cipher or the encryption unit that you are using to generate key is not powerful. You know, let, let's say if I give you an extreme example, if you go for, let's say, AES, then, then you won't be able to do that. Okay. But but uh, there, there are actually papers uh, they, they, that they talk about where they say that, okay, if you use pretty simple uh, low latency block ciphers, the attacker will be able to deduce what exactly is the key. Then, then the entire attack surface is open. Okay, sir. Okay. More questions? OK, if not, we can move on. I, I think I'm, I'm almost done. So the, the summary of what we have discussed so far is uh, that, that yeah, these are the attacks that are there and they will be there, right? Uh, but but uh, as we also emphasized or we also debated that they are not that practical, you know, com compared to other kinds of attacks that are already there in the system stack. Having said that, we have seen that uh, if we would have solved the cache attack problem, then Spectre meltdown uh, would not have come, right? So it's, it's just a connection of dots, right? If you connect all the dots, you will find that if you are not solving the problem now, tomorrow a new big problem may come, which can you know um, exploit the existing problem, right? So uh, that's why. It's, it's kind of important to come up with more and more attacks and try to find out more and more vulnerabilities in the offensive side of research. And in the defensive side, you know, the entire community now, now has to go down to the first order principle, right? How can we design whatever we have designed in the last 40 years in a way which will make everything secure, right? And this is a hard problem because the moment you want to make every, anything secure, there is a price for it. And usually the price is in the form of performance or energy, right? So if you can come up with an idea which doesn't hamper performance, which doesn't hamper energy consumption and still provide security, uh, then uh, it's the best solution for this problem, okay? Uh, so the research question that uh, I just talked about, right? But uh, you can also look into some of the top forums uh, which are security forums not related to uh, microarchitecture security only, along with some of the computer architecture conferences that I mentioned during the uh, morning uh, session, right? Most of the research is actually about coming up with new attack, new threat model, or performance security trade-off, or the game that I have been uh, saying, right? The, the cat and mouse game. You come up with a mitigation, I will come up with a new attack on that mitigation, right? And it goes on. So if you love this kind of game, then then the, this is actually a field uh, of, of uh, interest, right? Uh, at least you can go and look at uh, the papers or the ideas that are coming in, right? So with that, I will uh, stop, and then uh, I'll uh, stop by wishing you all uh, a happy 2022.
and hopefully we'll be able to CL plus COVID-19. Right. OK, with that, uh, thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. We have around seven, eight minutes. Are there any questions that we can take? Okay, maybe it's lunch time and uh, all are hungry, but but uh, yeah, feel free to go through the video. I'll 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 also upload the slides. If you are not clear about anything, feel free to uh, di directly text me, DM me. Okay, so we'll meet uh, again at two thirty for the labs. But if you haven't, uh, uh, you know, set up your uh, 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 infrastructure for the lab. Then I would suggest you join us maybe a bit early, maybe 2.15 or so, so that we'll try to resolve all the issues and start the lab at uh, 2.30 SAF. Okay. Biswa, you will be available at 4 for the doubt clearing. Yes, 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 I'll be, I'll be there. Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for the lab, we don't need to use the virtual machine, right? We can just do it on a local system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you don't need a virtual machine. OK, sir. Yeah. So whatever instructions that are provided by Yasika and Devasis, right? Just, just go through it. Uh, try to do whatever is possible. If you are still struggling, we'll try to resolve it in a better way. And then uh, we will make sure that you learn something during the lab. OK. So any questions or shall we stop here and meet again at 2.15 maybe? OK, then it, it seems it's lunch time. So Madhura, I'm kind of assuming it's uh, the, this particular session is over now. Yeah, all right. Yeah, thanks. See you later. Yeah.